Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shah, and I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Wambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Wambrew and I are here today to provide everyone an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine for today, Thursday, October 15th, 2020. I'll start with some updates and then Commissioner Wambrew and I will take questions from all our colleagues in the media. We begin today's update on a sad note. Maine has recorded its 144th death associated with COVID-19. She was a woman in her 90s from York County. We wish her friends, family, and community our deepest condolences during this time of their grieving. Right now, across the state, there are a total of 5,836 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 20 cases since yesterday. Of those, 5,206 are confirmed and 630 are probable cases. Roughly one third of the new cases recorded yesterday arose from Kennebec County. 17% of the cases from yesterday were from York County and Cumberland and Androscoggin County accounted each for approximately 14% of yesterday's new cases. Overall, 464 individuals have been hospitalized with COVID-19. And right now in the states, there are 11 individuals who are currently in the hospital, five of whom are in the intensive care unit and one of whom is on a ventilator. That brings our hospitalization rate to roughly one person for every 100,000 people in Maine who are hospitalized. To put that number in context, the national hospitalization rate is roughly 10 hospitalizations for every 100,000 people. As I mentioned a moment ago, sadly, there have been 144 individuals who have passed away with COVID-19 and 5,070 have recovered, an increase of 18 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are now 1,088 healthcare workers. Of the cases that Maine CDC began investigating yesterday, none of them was associated with a known outbreak. I mention that because it's a sign that there is increasing community level transmission across the state of Maine. I'd like to turn next to some updates on outbreaks in which Maine CDC is involved. Earlier today, Maine CDC opened an outbreak into the summer commons construction in Sanford. We are aware of four main residents associated with this outbreak and perhaps three residents from New Hampshire. Again, we've just started our investigation. And as we learn more about the nature of the outbreak, potential routes of transmission, as well as others who may be affected, we'll make sure to keep everyone up to date. I'd like to turn now to some open outbreaks in which Maine CDC has been involved. At the LL Bean Distribution Center, they recently conducted and completed their first round of testing and detected an additional 10 cases of COVID-19, bringing their current total to 17 cases. LL Bean is conducting another round of testing next week, and we'll, we're working very closely with them to make sure that all the resource requests that they have are being able to be fulfilled. At Pinnacle Healthcare, there are now a total of 24 cases, 15 of which are among residents, nine of which are among staff members. At ND Paper in Rumford, they recently completed their second round of universal testing and thankfully found no new positive cases. Similarly, at Woodland Pulp in Baileyville, they also completed their recent round of universal testing and likewise did not find any new cases. I'd like to next turn to provide some updates on where things stand with testing. Right now in Maine, our positivity rate on a seven day basis is 0.42%, a new low mark for us. To put that number in perspective, the national positivity rate remains at 5%, 
the rate right now in Maine is 0.42%. In terms of our testing volume, Maine is currently conducting roughly 453 PCR tests for every 100,000 people. To put that number in perspective, the national testing volume rate is about 300 tests for every 100,000 people. In summary, what that means is that as a state, Maine is conducting approximately 50% more PCR tests than the national average right now. Before we turn things over for questions, I'd like to provide an update on two fronts, both on first where things stand on vaccines, and then second, to take stock of where things stand as a state. Let's start with vaccines. Right now in the United States, there are four vaccines that are in various stages of clinical trials. Two of those trials are actually on pause right now because of adverse events that were detected in some of the participants of those trials. In general, one vaccine under investigation right now is manufactured by a company called Moderna. That trial remains active and is recruiting individuals as part of its phase three process. Another trial is on a vaccine manufactured by Pfizer, as well as a smaller biotech company. That trial too remains active. That, you, that vaccine is an interesting one because it requires ultra cold storage, both in terms of its transport, as well as up until the time it is administered. A third vaccine under investigation is one that's manufactured in partnership between AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical company, and Oxford University in the UK. That vaccine uses a slightly different mechanism to prompt an immune response. In the United States, that vaccine trial is currently on pause, although the trials have resumed in other countries. And finally, the last vaccine that's currently under investigation in the United States is one that's made in partnership between Johnson & Johnson and one of their affiliate companies, Janssen. It, it, uh, that trial, just as of yesterday, was temporarily also put on pause, again, because of an adverse event that was detected. This vaccine happens to be an interesting one because it requires only a single dose. Now, one note on some of the pauses that have happened with some of these trials. These pauses are part of a planned and periodic review that occurs by an independent board of scientists. They are the ones who have access to those data on a frequent basis and according to a preset algorithm, they know when to put the trial on pause and when to resume that trial. This is something that not only occurs in clinical trials, but is something that occurs according to a preset algorithm with the decisions made by an independent, unaffiliated board of scientists. Here in Maine, we are simultaneously planning for the arrival of a COVID-19 vaccine whenever that may be. And right now, we don't know when that will be but we have been having productive conversations with stakeholders across the state and intend to continue those conversations. Our goal is to build a vaccination framework for distribution that is accessible, flexible, and equitable. But there remain questions, as some of the ones that I noted. For example, distribution will present a challenge because at this time, we don't know which of the vaccines that ultimately receive approval will have heat stability, which ones will require minus 70 freezers and which ones might require normal freezers. Prioritization too is a topic that's on everyone's mind, but without knowing which vaccines will be available, when they will be available and what their efficacy is in different populations, questions remain. It's also important to keep in mind that the day that a vaccine is approved will not be the day that COVID-19 comes to an end. Although a vaccine or vaccines will be helpful, they won't make COVID-19 magically disappear overnight. Vaccines take time to manufacture, to deliver, to administer, to start working in the body, 
and to start providing protection at the level of the population. That's why it's important that we as a state keep at it. Some of the trends around COVID-19 over the past week or two have been deeply concerning. Overall, right now, COVID-19 has infected almost 8 million people across the United States and killed nearly 217,000 people, according to data from Johns Hopkins and the US CDC. Just yesterday in the United States, there were nearly 60,000 cases of COVID-19 reported, levels that we haven't seen since the summer. On average, the number of new COVID-19 cases just in the past week across the country is up about 16% nationwide, just in the past week. As of this morning, 35 states across the country are showing an increase in the number of new cases they log every single day. In fact, 35, those 35 states are not just showing an increase, but a 10% increase of the number of new cases every day. Now, right now, Maine is holding steady. We've been averaging approximately 30 cases per day over the last 14 days, which is actually down just a few percentage points from the prior two weeks. But if we look at what's happening around us, there are concerning signs. The number of cases in our neighbor, New Hampshire, have jumped 112% just over the past two weeks as compared to the prior two weeks. They went from averaging roughly 40 cases a day to now roughly 80 cases per day. Vermont, too, has seen a slight increase, but albeit with much smaller numbers. But if we take a look at our other friends in the Northeast, we see a 25% increase in new cases in Massachusetts recently. In Connecticut, we've also seen about a 100% increase, a doubling of the number of new cases just in the recent two week period. And in Rhode Island, roughly a 70% increase, also again, just over the past few weeks. Now again, Maine is holding steady, but we can't ignore what's happening in our neighbor's yards. If there were to be an increase in Maine, which is a risk, our robust testing architecture, as well as our strong force of contact tracers, numbering approximately 100, mean that we would be poised to detect and respond to any such increase. Our robust testing architecture would allow us to detect the early signs. We know that because our positivity rate at about 0.44%, 0.4% means that testing is widespread and robust. So we would be able to detect any early signs. And that, that team of 100 plus contact tracers means that we would have the ability to tamp down on outbreaks before they morph into something larger. But why let it get to that? Why react to the problem when we have an opportunity to prevent the problem? In public health, one of the things that we know is that what's predictable is preventable. We see the storm on the horizon. We have an opportunity now to be ahead of it. In the same way that no one in Maine would ever conceive of waiting until the ice storm hits before we start salting the roads, we have an opportunity right now to take action to prevent what we see on the horizon, what we see unfolding in 35 other states from arriving here. And the things that each and every one of you can do today are the things that we've talked about. Please wear a face covering. And as we go into indoor, as we go into colder uh, months where more gatherings are likely to occur indoors, please make sure you know who you're in interacting with. There's no shame in wearing a face covering, even when you're indoors, when you've got folks who are visiting who may not be strictly within your bubble. And speaking of bubbles, I know that's something that a lot of families have practiced over the summer, but as more folks are interacting in different ways, we've got to make sure that those discrete bubbles that we have don't turn into one big dome 
that allows for transmission to occur from family to family to family. We've got an opportunity to wear face coverings, to practice safe socializing when we're indoors and make sure that our bubbles are tight. Let's not throw away our shot. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media. Commissioner Lambrew and I are delighted to take any questions you've got. The first question for the afternoon goes to Joe Lawler. Um, yes, hi, Dr. Shaw. I have a, a question and then I'll, I'll have a, a follow-up. Um, so I, I know you were discussing, uh, just discussing how, you know, the increase in nearby states in, in cases. And um, so can you kind of explain a little bit more how that's a threat? I, I know that there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, tourism over the summer, but tourism didn't appear to be a, a, a major problem. Um, so can you describe how like the neighboring states, how, how they're a, a threat to us? Sure, Joe. I'm glad you asked that. The mechanism that we're concerned about here is, is less tourism and, and more um, individual travel. Uh, for example, during weekends, over holidays, individuals in Maine who might be going to see friends and family in nearby places, let alone far-flung places, and inadvertently picking up the virus when they happen to be visiting folks in places uh, in the Midwest, the upper Midwest, wherever they may be, and inadvertently bringing it back with them. Uh, one of the things that we've seen with COVID-19 is that we're not disconnected in any way. Maine, let alone any community in Maine, is not disconnected from the rest of the country. And so although tourism numbers, as we go into colder months, will not be what they were over the summer, there's still now the possibility of things like holiday travel coming or just casual weekend trips that people might be making to more affected areas and then themselves socializing in settings, indoors, in bars, tight restaurants, in living rooms, where they may be more exposed to the virus and potentially bringing it up here. That's one of the principal mechanisms that we're concerned about. There are others uh, that could happen, uh, travelers who are coming to Maine, uh, commercial venues, things of that nature. So it, there, it's not as if there's a single thing, it's all of those things. And what, we, what we've seen over the course of COVID is that increases that start in other states work their way here. Okay. Uh so then, uh, how close are you to um, having, you know, uh, reimposing some of these travel restrictions? And then, uh, just if I could very quickly also ask, uh, I, I know you're talking about how uh, po low positivity rates uh, help in suppressing, suppressing. The, vi the virus. Uh, can you explain that a little bit more? Like, are, are you is be specifically is because Maine has 0.4% or 0.5% positivity, are we, is that suppressing the virus to some extent? And if so, can you explain how? Thank you. Sure, Joe. I'll start with that latter one and then uh, we can talk about the former. The reason that the, po the positivity rate tells us two things. One thing that positivity rate tells us is how widespread is testing occurring across the state. The second thing that it tells us is, what is the complexion of the outbreak that we are seeing? A high positivity rate can signal two things. It can mean that you're not doing enough testing, A, and then B, the people that you are testing are those who are just really symptomatic, which is to say you're leaving a large part of the iceberg unobserved. A low positivity rate tells you two other, th the opposites of those things, which is there's a lot of folks who are being tested and then more importantly, the composition of who is being tested are folks who are not only symptomatic, but also those who don't have symptoms. That means we have better visibility into what is truly going on in terms of the outbreak in Maine because of our low positivity. It's not the testing per se that allows for the suppression. The testing and particularly the low positivity rates mean that we've got an early glimpse and can see spikes long before they result in 20 or 30 cases, we can see them when it's just one or two people. That then in turn allows our contact tracers and case investigators to jump in and to work with those individuals who have tested positive 
and work with our social services team to provide them safe, supportive isolation really quickly when we're just at the one or two case period and make sure that they're not spreading it to others. So that's the interplay between positivity rate and testing and case investigation and contact tracing. They feed into each other, but the favorable positivity rate means that we can see these small increases before they morph into bigger situations. Uh, and then, then Joe, you asked about um, uh, other states. So we evaluate what's going on in other states all the time. Uh, right now, I'm focused on making sure that I'm briefing everybody on what we're seeing in other states. The first best thing we can do to keep ourselves safe in Maine is to do things like face coverings and being mindful of who we're interacting with. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Rebecca Stefanski at News Center. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Hi. Um, this week, it seems like there was a, a, a jump in the number of active cases since the pandemic began. It seemed previously that even when there was a relatively high number of positive cases, there were also recoveries that sort of balanced it out day to day. Um, do you have an explanation for why it seems the active numbers are higher? Rebecca, I've, I've taken a quick look at this. I don't know that they are statistically out of proportion with the number of new cases that we've seen. Um, just, just to, to be just to be clear, the, what we mean, um, we, we don't use the term active cases on our website. What we refer to are cases who are confirmed and then those who have recovered and then those who have sadly passed away um, because active implies that they are actively infectious and we, we don't necessarily know that. And so when we look on our website at the category of folks who are in this other category, uh, I, I believe it's risen largely in keeping in, in proportion to the number of new cases that we've had. Uh, I, I don't know that it's been out of proportion to that. Okay. Um... Okay, but it did pique your interest enough to look. It seems. Oh, it, oh, I, I look at all of these numbers okay. every single morning. It's it's how I it's it's what I do when I'm having my breakfast. <laughs> okay, me too. <laughs> um, and I also have a question, and maybe this is for you as well, but um, for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, it's kind of a two part. One, um, a uh, superintendent in MSAB 35 sent a letter out saying that they only learned of a positive case in their school community because of the new dashboard um, that was released this week. And so I wanted to know what we, um, one, where the breakdown in communication there may have been, um, but also what is the information that we should be learning from looking at this dashboard and how can we use that in a useful way? Sure, uh, Commissioner, I, I can take the second part if you wanna take the first part. Sure, so we are committed in all aspects of COVID-19 response to transparency, trying to make sure that when we have information, when is possible protecting people's privacy to post that, especially when it has some sort of value to our public health efforts. What we discovered, and a number of other states are doing the same, is that when it comes to schools, we get data through the main CDC that Dr. Shaw can talk about the confirmed and probable cases and how we determine outbreaks, that we do our best to communicate as quickly as possible to the Department of Education, who has a liaison to every school district, to try to keep those lines of communication going. But we also recognize that um, we have information that we should probably post. There's going to be gaps. There's going to be corrections. A person who is a probable case one day may get a test, and that may make them a confirmed case, or it could make them a negative case. So they may change. These data change a lot, and we appreciate the challenges with data changing on a frequent basis. But I'll flip it around. We feel it's important when the public wants to know how many school-based outbreaks are there and have there been has there been one or more case in a school that we post that for full transparency? I, and you know, Rebecca, I'll, I'll, I completely concur with what Commissioner Lambrew laid out. I'll add to the to the note you raised in your second question. I think the one thing to, that, that I bear in mind as I look at those data um, is I also, I know, in any kind of data related exercise, context really matters. The denominators, for example, matter. 
And so one thing that, that my team and I talk about that I bear in mind is uh, what the denominators are of some of those numbers. There are roughly 180,000 or so children in public schools and private schools in Maine. I think that's an important denominator. But as, as Commissioner Wambrew noted, our goal in posting these data is to make sure that everyone in the state has visibility into the same types of data that we're looking at as we're thinking about what's happening in schools and what the complexion of COVID-19 is in the school setting. There are lots of different ideas, but I, as, as folks are looking at the data and thinking about the conclusions that they might be drawing, I, I would urge everyone to bear in mind what the commissioner noted, which is in an outbreak setting, the data that we have and that we post on any of our websites is a picture of a very fast moving train and it's just a snapshot in time of that it can and absolutely will change because that's what happens in outbreaks things change as more testing happens as more investigations happen numbers can go up numbers can go down and so it's important to keep all of those very very uh, quick moving factors in mind as you're looking at those data great thank you so much mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Allison Ross at WMTW. Allison, we will come back to you in a moment while we turn to Amy Brown. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, regarding the adverse events and vaccine trials, do they pause for any type of health event that happens <laughs> that they can't explain? and? Uh, what are the standards for that? Do they just pause until they can figure out what caused it or how does that work? It's a great question, Amy. And it varies greatly trial by trial, vaccine by vaccine. But what, what is important to note here is that these decisions are not made on an ad hoc basis. In order to qualify as a properly done clinical trial, each and every one of these decisions and the criteria that govern the answers to each of the questions you raised those are set forth in advance. Um, and so the researchers who are independent of the company decide the criteria under which a vaccine trial or any clinical trial for that matter will be paused, will be scrapped altogether. What types of situations will govern when something is an event that constitutes a pause? And then as you referenced, the conditions under which the trial will be restarted. If someone has an adverse event that is completely unrelated to the trial whatsoever in every possible way imaginable. Um, then it may be one where the investigators look at it and the trial isn't paused. By converse, if it's even plausibly related, it might be. The answers to these things are very fact and trial dependent, but I think my key point here is that these are not ad hoc decisions. They are set forth in the clinical trial protocols well in advance. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, following up on something else you were talking about earlier, I was also looking at the uh, New York Times and John Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins trackers, and it looks like in the past two weeks, every state that Maine exempts from the vaccine, the negative, I mean, the negative test or uh, quarantine recommendations when visiting Maine has seen increases in cases ranging from 25% to 112%, like every one of them over the past two weeks. So do you anticipate any changes or new recommendations leading up to Thanksgiving? Uh, Amy, I think it's really gonna depend on where we see things going in Maine, as well as where we see things going in those other states. I don't think any final decisions have been made. The reason I wanted to talk about this today is to let everybody know what's going on in our neighbor's yards. Uh, I, we track these data, we review them. I've discussed them with my colleagues in the Northeast, actually, last night on a call, we convened a special call, a, a call rather, a scheduled call to discuss what's happening just in the Northeast. Um, what I heard my colleagues talk about in their states was concerning, and that's why I wanna talk about it with everyone today. Where we go from here as a policy matter is something that we're discussing. Uh, options that you laid out are options, but there are things that we can do right now in Maine today to keep ourselves safe. That's where we should start. Again, there are also simultaneously policy decisions happening, discussions happening, but we should start with the things that we can do today. Uh, Commissioner? 
And I'll add that we have worked hard in Maine to expand our testing capacity. So we maintain the recommendation that if you are traveling to a state with higher prevalence of COVID-19, you may be at expo elevated risk of COVID-19 because of your travels, you should get a test. You can go to our Keep Maine Healthy website and see the list of the swab and send, the sends, the so-called sites where we sponsor those sites, and you can get a test for free in most parts of Maine. So we remain supportive of the idea if you are traveling and you come back to Maine or you're coming from another state to Maine, you should get tested because that is a way to detect whether or not you were exposed and contracted COVID-19 during your travels. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Allison Ross. Allison? Hi, can you hear me now, Dr. Shaw? We can. Go ahead. All right, good news there. Okay, so Halloween is coming up. It's just around the corner. Now, has anything changed in terms of your thoughts on trick-or-treating? Should it matter if a person's county is green or yellow? And do you have concerns about going door to door? Could you catch COVID-19 even if you're not standing in the house for like 15 minutes or so? Uh, something that's been under discussion, Commissioner Lambrew and I have discussed it at length. I'll turn it over to the commissioner. Sure. And I'll begin by, we appreciate all the questions that have come in. So we've actually posted guidance um, on the COVID-19 prevention checklist page. You can find guidance that's called seasonal activities. Because here in Maine, we want people to be able to safely enjoy activities so long as we can put those guardrails in around physical distancing and face coverings. So for example, you can find in that guidance information on haunted houses and how to do so safely, hay rides, corn mazes, including what are lower and moderate and higher risk activities when it comes to trick-or-treating. We wanted to do this in the same way we would approach all other guidance, looking at the evidence, looking at best practices, running them by stakeholders, in this case, case families, and trick-or-treaters to make sure that they made sense. So we think that there is a way to enjoy Halloween safely, so we urge people to look at that guidance and follow it. Great. And then Dr. Shaw, is there any update on the hockey referee situation? Are we learning anything else about that? Um, Allison, uh, I, I, right before this, I met with our epidemiology team uh, to, to get the latest on, on that as well as other situations. Uh, we, we, we are aware of one individual that we are in, who has tested positive, who played hockey on the two days in question. We are conducting further investigations uh, into whether this individual interacted with the referee that we've noted. Uh, so at this time, we are aware of that one individual, but further investigation is needed before we can say that this is linked in, in the manner that I think your question is asking. We should hopefully have some additional information on that as we work with this individual to know exactly, for example, what their degree of interaction was with this particular referee, so on and so forth. We're simultaneously though, Allison, uh, aware of other outbreaks that have occurred in hockey settings. Uh, not too long ago, I spoke with my counterpart in Alaska uh, because they're investigating an outbreak uh, in Alaska that, was, that generated a significant number of cases. Uh, here in the Northeast, as I mentioned, I've checked in with my counterparts. Uh, my counterparts in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts happened to be investigating outbreaks associated with hockey. Uh, actually, just about an hour and a half ago, the US CDC published in its marquee journal uh, a, a case report on an investigation in Florida uh, regarding a transmission event, an outbreak that occurred there in Florida related to hockey. So we're, we're aware of these other things and we're learning from the outbreak investigations that other states have conducted as we're thinking about the exposure event here. Just as a reminder, our first and foremost goal as a public health agency is that when we learn of information where a large number of individuals could have been exposed, our first goal is to let the public know about that so that they can take steps to monitor for symptoms and get tested. That's our first and foremost goal. After, after that, then we start investigating whether other cases of COVID-19 could be potentially linked. That's why as soon as we learned about this information, I wanted to let everybody know and not sit on that for an extra minute. 
Now we're going through the process as we would expect epidemiologically now, cases to start being reported. Our, our attempt now is to link new cases with the exposures that may have occurred on October 3rd and 4th. But again, our goal is to let people know of what we know in a matter to be transparent and protect public health. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. In terms of the increase in cases in nearby states, in your discussions with your counterparts in those states, have you found any common reasons that explain why that's happening? The hypothesis of my counterparts, not just in the Northeast, but as well as in the Northern Plains and in the Midwest, where there are also increases happening, the theme that seems to have emerged in my discussions with them are close familial level gatherings that have been occurring indoors. Uh, there, there are, of course, likely to be other reasons as well, other routes of transmission. But what my counterparts have described to me are a number of small focal increases in cases. That is to say clusters of two or three cases scattered across the states as opposed to large significant outbreaks. That points the way toward uh, transmission occurring at smaller gatherings, social events that are occurring indoors. That's one of the reasons I wanted to share these data today and just make sure that folks know that as they themselves are gathering indoors, as we get into colder months in Maine, be extra alert for folks for the possibility that transmission can occur in settings like that. And then sort of related to that, you've been saying that you're seeing more cases of COVID-19 here in Maine that aren't connected to outbreaks, which is a sign of greater community transmission. Up until now, have most of the cases been associated with outbreaks and is that starting to transition? Are, are we seeing a shift? It, 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 uh, so um, I'm glad you raised that, Patty. Let me, let me provide one uh, first a methodology or data note. Uh, when we uh, assign cases out for investigation, uh, the number that I reported, for example, as of the cases assigned out, none has been associated with an outbreak. That's at the time that the case investigation begins. As we start putting together pieces of the puzzle, we may later detect an outbreak that occurred at location X. And then we will go back to all of the people who reported being at location X and later associate them with the outbreak. So it's not fixed forever that these are not associated. Going back to the earlier note, outbreaks are fast moving trains and we might later learn that folks are associated. The number that I reported is just based on the outbreaks that are known to us right now. It has varied week to week. Um, there have been some weeks when we have been in the throes of very large significant outbreaks. Uh, those that have occurred in nursing homes or those that were associated uh, with the events of the August 7th wedding were a high fraction of the new cases that we saw every day, 50, 60% were outbreak associated. Other weeks it has been down to where it is right now. Uh, there has been a, a gradual trend over the past three weeks toward fewer and fewer cases on a daily basis being associated with known outbreaks. I'm not ready to say that it's statistic statistically significant. We still need a little bit more data, but that has been a trend that we've observed. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Dave at WGME. Good afternoon, Dr. Shah and Commissioner Lambrew. Um, Allison actually um, asked uh, what I was, you know, my first question was related to the hockey referee. Um, Dr. Shaw, in layman's terms, how do you contact trace uh, an individual back to, say, this hockey referee? And I, the reason why I ask that is it hockey's the one sport where you're you're never really stagnant. You know, you're not six feet away or you're you're not really close to somebody for a lengthy period of time. the The kids are always moving. So how would you determine? Uh, that uh, the you know the this supposed COVID case it would be linked to the referee. Sure. So, Dave, let's uh, let's start with just hockey in general. Uh, you know, uh, I, I hear where you're coming from. It's a, a fast moving, rapid moving sport. Uh, but at the same time, what we've seen in some of the data, including this report that the U.S. CDC itself just validated and published, has shown that outbreaks can occur 
when, from players being on the ice, uh, even though they're fast moving, even though they're constantly in motion. When you couple that with other factors that we know that can increase the likelihood of transmission, exercising, breathing really heavily, those things can all taken together can generate situations where outbreaks can happen. Are they the norm? Uh, we, we don't know that yet. Uh, am I suggesting that hockey is an ultra high risk activity? No. Hockey is appropriately categorized where it is, a medium risk activity. But that doesn't mean we should automatically conceive of it as a zero risk activity. Our, our job is to talk about what it is that we know so that individuals can make decisions and do the things they want to do in a safe manner. Now, in terms of the, the, the specifics around contact tracing, question one right now for us, Dave, with this individual who that was just reported to us last night, is to verify whether they were on the ice for any of the eight games that we are aware of. If so, that increases the likelihood that their transmission was from the referee. Does it make it a slam dunk case? We'll have to do more digging to find that out. But then we always on a daily basis, as new cases come in, given what we know about this mass exposure event, every single new case that comes in is asked by a contact tracer, you play hockey, have you been on the ice? Were you on the ice on October 3rd and 4th? Where else have you been playing? We're, look, we're asking those questions because that's the only way we'll find out the answers. It's not that we're waiting for people to tell us that, we're proactively asking. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. And Commissioner Lambert, one quick question for you. Do you, uh, do you have a ballpark time frame when you and other state agencies and the MPA may make a decision regarding the winter high school sports season? So we are engaging with those organizations you know, now to get ready for this, ready, recognizing that winter is coming rapidly. We're doing what we've done previously, looking at the evidence, looking at what other states have done, learning from what we've seen in different types of sports leagues to figure out whether the categorization of low, moderate, and high risk continue to make sense, are there practices for mitigation that could work better than others? So we are at the beginning part of that process. We hope to work in tandem going out with the guidance on winter sports, recognizing that the, you know, it was not an ideal situation over the summer that we didn't quite have everything synced up um, from the start, but we got there at the end. So we are hoping the process will improve. And I will note that we do try to learn as we go. Just going back to hockey for one second, you know, we have governed the recreational hockey and other private leagues through our community sports guidance. Those guidance documents have been, or guidelines have been up since the spring. We mostly have in those guidance documents recommendations for different sports. In light, for example, of the challenges Dr. Shaw just talked about with hockey, the checklist or guidance recommends that we try to limit team travel, try to do intramural as much as possible, and when possible, compete outdoors, knowing that that isn't always possible. I do recognize the fact that should we find that there are indeed outbreaks or elevated risks associated with sports like hockey, we will modify our guidance and enforce as necessary. Okay, great. Thank you both very much. I appreciate it. You got it, Dave. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Alyssa Thurlow at WABI. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, some outbreaks, you know, at schools, some schools have seen cases, and we talked about the holidays approaching, and some families might be adjusting their travel plans or just, you know, plans with families in general. How should parents really talk to their kids about this? You know, kids look forward to this time of year. What should they be saying and what would you say to your own kids? Um, well, uh, you know, Alyssa, uh, I've been, we've been thinking about this a lot. Um, and none other than Dr. Fauci himself uh, has recently talked about this uh, on, on national TV. Uh, perhaps uh, folks have noted that he himself mentioned that his own family members, his kids, won't be coming to see he and his wife this Thanksgiving because of their concerns about potentially bringing COVID into the Fauci household. Uh, that, that to me, when I, when I heard Dr. Fauci say that was, was really striking. Um, it, it demonstrates that 
this year's holiday season probably won't look the same as prior holiday seasons and changes will be necessary. Uh, and, and again, to hear someone of the stature of Dr. Fauci himself acknowledge that. And, and, and when I watched him say it, it was, it was really clear, uh, you know, the, the emotional toll that that acknowledgement had on him. Um, we can all imagine wanting to see our families over the holidays. So uh, in terms of how to how to talk about it, I, I'm going to be candid. I'm, I'm not I'm not the best person who's equipped to, to provide guidance there. I'll just be straight with everybody. What we've talked about in our family with with my mother and my spouse and, and her family is um, even though holiday travel and holiday gatherings might not look the same, we can still try to find ways to connect even at a distance. Indeed, that's been, I think, one of the themes, one of the, the challenges that so many of us have gotten better at during COVID. We can still be apart, but still be together. It's harder on holidays, right? We're, there's so much ritual and tradition uh, around some of these sacred holidays, the carving of the turkey and the sitting around and talking about what we're thankful for. But there are ways to do that. Even though they might look different, that doesn't mean they'll be any worse. And that's the mindset that my family and I are going into the holiday season with. Different, definitely. Worse, let's hope not. Okay, thanks, Dr. Shaw. And the final question of the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle. Thank you very much. Um, just wanted to double check. Uh, wanted to double check something real, real quick. It sounded like uh, if I if I understood this correctly, you said that the daily rates of uh, coronavirus cases in all five of the other New England states are all trending upwards, but. It doesn't sound like a like a rescinding of the of the exemption rules to the to the quarantine or testing requirements is eminent. Is it fair to say that, Patrick? I think what, how I would characterize it is that we're always looking at the data in those other states. Some of the increases that I've noted are things that I've just been briefed on by counterparts or data that have just emerged, you know, in the last day or two. Um, that these trends have become more concrete. Uh, we still have steps that are available to us short of things like rescinding or changing quarantine and testing requirements, such as better use of face coverings, making sure that when we're indoors, we're monitoring who we're around. That's where we should be starting. Uh, but there are simultaneously reviews of those data occurring at a policy level as well. Uh, Commissioner, does that square with you? Yes. Got it. Um, also, um, I'm curious if the state has uh, has ever um, closed out the, the Millinocket uh, wedding and reception related outbreak, or if we're still if that if that's still technically considered an active an active uh, an active outbreak. Um, so, uh, Patrick, you know there there were multiple different components of that investigation, um, and. Um, the one component was at the Big Moose in itself. Uh, that invest that portion of the investigation was closed after they met the quantitative mathematical criteria. Uh, another component was at the York County Jail. Uh, that component was recently closed as well after meeting the same strict criteria. The Maple Crest facility, uh, because it is a nursing home, they are continuing with testing. They have had occasional cases. Uh, so they have they are their their status is still open, but they have also had stability. That is to say, not having had new cases, but they still need to meet the full criteria for closure. Which it, to be to be to round out that circle, full twenty eight days, two incubation periods with no new cases. Oh, okay, great! Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Patrick, thanks for that question. Uh, thanks to all of our colleagues for those questions. Uh, again, as a, a quick reminder from my end, we're seeing things on the horizon that are concerning, but we all have the wherewithal here today to take steps to make sure that we here in Maine are staying safe. I'd like to encourage everyone to do those things. It really is right now as simple as keeping physical distance, wearing face coverings, being mindful, especially during indoor gatherings. Commissioner, I want to hand it over to you for any last words you may have today. Sure. I want to comment on the fact that we know sports are valuable in so many ways. 
They promote cardiovascular and bone health. They promote mental health and social engagement. And we all learn from being on teams and competing and being in those environments to say nothing of the fact that they are a source of pride and entertainment for so many of us. But the COVID-19 pandemic has required Maine people to rise to the occasion unlike any other in our lifetimes. Fighting the virus demands sacrifice and vigilant and efforts by each and every one of us to learn and practice in new ways to protect not only ourselves, but our loved ones in our communities. So we appreciate the challenge of sports and theater and music and singing and all those types of activities that have not occurred the same way under the pandemic due to these precautions. But we are hopeful that as we continue this vigilance, we can get to a day where there might be the treatments and the vaccine or the practices that allow us to re-engage. So we do thank Maine people for their patience and their work on trying to figure out how we can do sports safely. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your time. As always, please be kind and take care of one another. We'll talk again next week. Thank you all.